We as blacks, we are only 11 or 12% of the total population. Yet we are consumers of over 33% of all the hair care products sold in this country. And that's why they settled in our neighborhoods. And they specialize in hair. We are 80% of the purveyors of hair, the users of hair. So that's why they, they came to, into our neighborhoods. And I can't be mad at them because we left that market land right out there in the street, and they came along and picked it up. So don't, wait, don't encourage anybody to throw a rock through a Korean beauty st supply store, <laughs> okay? I think now, though, and I see so much vibrancy here, and especially with this new organization, you've got a new feeling of togetherness that we don't even have on the East Coast. And to the fact that you have decided that it's time now to forget the mistakes we've made especially with the Koreans, who were smart enough to know that they couldn't make it with the white companies. They would not get across those big white distributors who represented the major white lines, like Redkin, Matrix, Paul Mitchell. They couldn't cut it. They were ostracized. And so they turned to us who were open, young, and probably didn't realize the value of our industry. And they made it big with us. But we've got to forget that now. It's hard. And we've got to outsmart what is out there. And let's go together to do it. And who knows what will happen tomorrow. I'm just going to stay in the game and, if for no other reason to see what happens next. What will the future of the black hair industry be? Can Bobsa and the African American community be successful in taking back part of this industry? It's ironic but true that the first American woman self-made millionaire was an African-American named Madam C.J. Walker, who earned her fortune through the manufacture and distribution of black hair products. <laughs>